It's freezing. <laughs> freezing? Oh, well, we'll start playing and you'll warm up, right? <laughs> I tell you what, I don't know about you, but my screen sweat is free all the time. Yeah, right yeah. Good. All right, good morning, Catalyst. How's everybody doing? You guys good? Awesome. You guys want to stand up with me? Uh, my name's Jared. I'm filling in for Daniel this morning, and um, I'm really excited to worship with you guys uh, this morning. We're going to sing a song. Uh, it may be a new one for you guys, but uh, the idea of it is just magnifying the name of Jesus. And so what a better way to start so I'm going to invite you guys into this. We're creation. We're creation. Suddenly I take it land. thousand, thousand tongues to live one cry. Live from north to south. I won't bow to idols. I won't bow to idols. I'll 
stay strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you.
rest in that. We rest in His goodness, His mercy. And we respond with all the earth is crying out. All the earth will shout your praise. Uh -huh. just recognize in this moment you are our only hope. God, we recognize that you are the light that leads us, that makes a way, that makes a path clear. God, we lean into that light this morning, uh, the light of your word. We lean into it and we cling to it. We cling to your truth. our hearts to receive it this morning, if you open our ears to hear it this morning, let nothing get in the way, we want all of you, we love you Jesus, amen, you just have a seat.
Good morning, Catalyst Church, here on campus and online as well. So glad to have you here this morning. My name is Virgil. I'm one of the pastoral staff here, and so glad to see you this morning. We're a church that's all about knowing Christ and making him known. We do that through a simple process of experiencing God in our life, growing and discovering the gifts and callings God is giving each and every one of us, and then going into our world to share the love of Jesus Christ in practical ways. It's a simple process, but we see lives transformed every week from our children to our youth to our adults through that simple process when we apply it to our lives beyond just a Sunday morning experience to really living it out throughout the week. So this church coming up this week on Tuesday is celebrating 28 years. That's awesome, and we want to celebrate that. 28 years of being in existence of knowing Christ and making him known. So we just say a thank you to Pastor Steve Dixon and Pastor Terry Baker and Pastor Nate Sweeney for just the years of being in this area saying we want to make Jesus famous. So thank you so much for that and celebrate with us. So we did want to highlight a few things for you. If you're new with us, thank you for checking us out this morning. Uh, we have Connect Cards out at the Welcome Center. Or if you want to do things digitally or online, there's a QR code behind me. Also, there's a URL. If you'll fill that out, let us know a little bit about yourself. We'd love to connect with you this week and answer some questions you might have and I give some direction. We just would like to hear from you. We'd love to pray with you about planting. Where, is, where are you called to plant in the body of Christ? So we'd love to talk about that with you. If you're saying, man, I'd like to take that next step here at Catalyst, and I've been coming for a few weeks now, we want to invite you to Discover Catalyst next week on Sunday afternoon from about 2 to 3.30. We uh, come here, and we're going to sit down with some other leaders here at Catalyst, and we just want to hear a little bit about your story, and we'll share a little bit more about the Catalyst story with you and how maybe you can connect here and plant in a deeper way. So if you're interested in that, please go to our church app or go to our website to register for these events. There's also a quite a few other events there they can register for. There's some classes coming up, some uh, men's events, some amazing stuff happening there. We do want to highlight one of those classes, though, this morning for you, and it's making your emotions work for you. This class has been in the works for years. When I say years, I mean years. Uh, where Pastor Nate and Mount Monica have been discussing this. It's part of some of the things I've talked about in my life and many others. And we've done some series over the last few years on Sunday morning talking about our emotions. And we all have them, even though I'm a man and sometimes I don't want emotions, but I have them. Uh, so how do we have those and deal with them in a holy way? And that's what this class is going to be about. It's going to be for six weeks. And there's multiple ways for you to be able to engage with this class. So please go online, go on the app and read about these. But we have an option for on campus during a weeknight. We have a virtual option. So if you're online or you're in a different part of the country, you still can connect with this content. We have uh, a time where you can even get with the digital content and connect with a leader and also a Sunday morning aspect as well. So please go online. There should be a way for you to connect with this content because we believe it is important for the body of Christ to know about. So we do want to celebrate Catalyst Church here for a moment beyond just celebrating 28 years this coming week. We did the Samaritan Center uh, school drive, and we went past our goal. So I want to read some of those stats for you. So we had said our goal is 300 packets of college rule paper. Did that. 325 packs of mechanical pencils did that all within the first week. That's, wow, way to go, Catalyst Church. But people kept giving way beyond that, so we ended up purchasing an additional 7,000 pencils. Way to go. And it gets better than that. Our children's ministry said, hey, we want to partner with this as well because our kids can sew back and do, share in a practical way. Our children's ministry raised $247 for this. That's amazing when your children's ministry is saying, hey, we're dedicated to this too. That's powerful, guys. Speaking of our family ministry, this coming week, they're headed off to summer camp. So be, please be praying for the youth and children going to summer camp, and especially the leaders, because sometimes sleep is not happening. So please be praying for that. Spent many years going to youth camp, so I, I totally get their experience there. But please, please be praying for them during that time to really experience God and just hear Him in a greater way and build some amazing community. With that, there will be no youth this coming Wednesday night. So if you're here on, still in the area, go hang out with your parents, have fun, eat some ice cream. So with that being said, everyone, if you'll stand with me during this portion, as Pastor Nate gets ready to come share the message, we'd love to have you greet a few people around you and say, good morning, glad to see you. Well, we play some good music.
Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. We always love gathering uh, in biblical community. Uh, it's just something, that obviously, the Bible calls us to do, but uh, that we get to do it here in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, my name is Nate. For those of you who don't know, I'm one of the leaders here. I get to share today. Uh, we're in session 14, actually session 13 of our Timothy series. But we took the last, last week and this week, we're going to be kind of taking one of the verses in a different direction, talking about the sanctity of human life. Uh, what I would like to say, uh, if you were not here last Sunday, uh, please, 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 if this is something that really, you know, spikes, you know, something inside of you, good or bad, please go back and listen to that. We laid a very long, uh, practical, biblical um, mindset. What does the Bible say about that? Today we're going to get a little bit more into some science and some worldviews conversation because as Christians, sometimes you say it's because the Bible says so and people say, I don't care about the Bible. So you've got to have, you know, a bigger worldview conversation. If you weren't with us last year, we spent a lot of time talking about grace and truth. We don't minimize truth uh, because people don't want to talk about sin. We keep the standard of truth where it's at, the biblical standard. But then we talk about it in a loving, compassionate way. you got to remember, everybody's in process. So if you're a non-believer in here today, you're in a process. God's drawing you into relationship with him, whether you know it or not. He loves you. He has a purpose for your life. If you're a new believer or if you've been a believer for many, many years, all of us is in this process of sanctification um, as new believers, as believers. And so we're all at different places in the parade. And so some people might come to the Lord and not have a strong theology. So they're like, yeah, I, I believe this and I've, I understand this. And so we can't just cram the Bible down their throat. We have to say, okay, let's invite you into deeper conversations. Uh, first of all, with the Holy Spirit. Second of all, what does the Bible say? Let's go back to the word of God. And so uh, this is not an easy topic. Uh, it's not, it, it is scripturally, and, and as we talked about last week, scientifically, embryotically, biologically, it's black and white. It's just, there, it, the science is just not unclear. The Bible's not unclear, okay? But how that's lived out is very complicated because of the world we live in, and everybody's experiences are differently. So, again, if you have questions, comments, concerns, we love those. We want to sit and walk with this, uh, walk you through this conversation. But if you won't even sit through last week and this week and you want to come rant and rave, well, let's maybe go back and listen to last week first, and then you can come rant and rave. I was told after first service, uh, you missed your calling. I think you should have been a lawyer. I've been told that many, many times. Uh, I do like to argue. It's just in my nature. I don't know. I don't understand that. My wife hates it. Uh, unless I'm on her side, then she loves it. She's not in here today. I can talk all I want, right? She's not. She already went home. So, uh, but let's let's jump into the sanctity of human life part two. Last week we talked broader than just abortion. It was it was bigger than that, and it is bigger than that because if you go back and listen, it's not just about that topic. Today we're going to spend a little more time on abortion. Uh, today we want to talk about how we can share our faith during the chaos. This topic is very chaotic, and a lot of Christians just say, "I know what I believe. I'm going to stay out." We have to be in the world and share the love of Christ in practical ways. That's part of being a disciple. So how can I share my faith in the chaos? That's what I'm taking the time today because we want you to be armed with tools and actually help you realize there's a solid conversation you can have with people, not to win arguments, but to really show people truth and love. Uh, today we want to talk about following the science and reason and not just arbitrary arguments or agendas. And then the last one, just let's continue to walk in love. What, what do we say all the time around at Catalyst? What's the equation of love? Love equals grace plus truth. John 1, 14, Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. And if you get unbalanced in any one of those, if you get on the truth side, you become a law legalist and beat people over the head with the Bible. If you get too much on the grace side, you leave the law out and you say, well, it's just all about my feelings. And, you know, I just want to love you and encourage you. But yet you neglect the truth. And so we want to walk with that fine line. From last week, we talked about the fallacy that says nowhere does the Bible condemn abortion or mention it. We talked about just because the Bible doesn't address something in name, the Bible, the word Bible is not in the Bible, right? The word grandfather is not in the Bible. So we talked about that last week. We talked about abortion is not the unpardonable sin. We talked about all of us are equal at the foot of the cross, no matter your background, no matter your history, no matter the sin that, that was prevalent in your life. We all need the grace of God. We're all equal in that. Your sin's just different than my sin. So none of us, at least from the catalyst perspective, we're not looking down our nose 
to people that think differently or that have had abortions or have forced girlfriends to have abortions. Again, we're all equal at the foot of the cross, but we're at the foot of the cross. We got to go with what Jesus says. Humans are made in the image of God. Last week we talked about that. That's God values us because of that. When does life begin? God tells us in the Bible that it begins at conception. So that's going to be my worldview, not what I think or feel. A preborn child is known by God. We talked about that. We talked about a preborn child has a soul. We talked about if the Bible and science agree that the child in the womb is fully human from the one stage cell, which we talked about last week, agree, then we ask this question. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? If science agrees, which every embryo embryologist will tell you, if, if, it's a, if it's an honest scientist, if it's an honest biologist, they will tell you from the one cell stage, fully human, fully person, right? You can argue the personhood thing conversation another day, but science says what it says, right? And then the Bible says what it says. So let's call it what it is. When we use the term abortion at Catalyst, it is the taking of innocent life. It's murder. People that, that grinds people, and we're not saying it haphazardly or just, you had an abortion, you're a murderer, nothing like that. What we're saying is let's continue to do what the Bible says, call sin, sin, so that people can recognize their sin, they can turn from their sin to God in repentance and find healing and grace and redemption and forgiveness, all of those things. But forgiveness does not come if we ignore sin. Forgiveness does not come if we call sin something else. We can't just ignore these topics. And again, I th well, we'll get into that in a minute. But let's jump into pick up where we left off last week. Pre-born children in the Bible have legal rights. The first five books of the Old Testament are called the books of the law because they provide the legal framework for God's old covenant people. In this law, an unborn child is clearly seen as a fully human being with full legal rights. And when their life is taken, murder has been committed and capital punishment is mandated. And that's speaking of Exodus 31, which we're gonna, or 21, which we're going to talk about today. Exodus 21 and Numbers 5 are the two places people would say the Bible talks about this topic. And it actually leans towards God is in pro, he's pro-abortion. Which when we read it, you're going to see today, where do you get that from? If you don't know your Bible, probably don't use the Bible because you're actually proving the point of pro-life. And so uh, in the last research I did, 37 states in America have fetal homicide laws and the person in the womb has rights. So if I were to murder a woman that's pregnant, I would be charged with two counts of murder. 37 states have those laws. Many of those same states, if that woman were to go that same week before I killed her and go to an abortion clinic, and terminate the pregnancy and murder the child, it's completely legal and everybody just looks the other way and says, well, it's her choice. That's a bit arbitrary. That's a bit selective, right? That can't be. Where's the justice in that? We've got to look and say, stop making these emotional or um, one-sided arguments and we've got to actually be able to argue these things intellectually. And a lot's changed in the last 50, 60 years with science and technology, where science, we talked about this last week, is discovering what the Bible has said all along in so many ways. If you've seen this last week, all of the pictures from the new telescope that's out there and how it just continues to remind us how small we are. And all these scientists are saying there's got to be intelligent life that created all of this. You call it a Marvel character. Somebody calls it an alien. We call it Jesus. We call it he's the creator of all, right? And so it, it, science is saying you can no longer say we're just primordial slime that just blew up from a rock. I mean, it's just even scientists are saying, come on, let go of that. That's a dumb argument anymore. There's intelligent life out there, but they want to point away from the Bible, which is fine. You have the right to do that. But as Christians, we know what the Bible says. So Exodus 21, 23 this is, this is interesting. If men fight and hurt a woman, let me just back up. In Exodus, he begins, I think in chapter 19 or 20, he begins, uh, we got to remember this is a, a group of people that were in bondage to slavery for many, many years. If you study that time in history, it was a very barbaric time. There wasn't a lot of law. Like we have, we have you, know, you know, the United Nations and NATO and we have the Geneva Convention and all these things that most nations will say, okay, that's wrong and, and this is right, okay? So there's these, these codes of conduct or these laws on an international level. There wasn't anything like that back then. So God's giving his people, these are some very specific laws that pertain to your group for this time in history. Many of them are moral laws that actually supersede time and place. 
They're moral laws that are for all people for all time, not just, you know, laws just for the Jews. And so here's one of those that is very specific to them, but also carries a moral code with it. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. So you got two guys fighting. One of them, you know, the, bumps the other guy's wife in the belly, and she miscarries. You know, the baby comes out, but the baby's actually okay. It's premature, but everything's fine. There's still a penalty imposed, but it's not murder. It's, or it's not, you know, the innocent killing of, a, of, of an unborn, right? It's saying that that life had personhood, that life was, was valuable. It just came out early. It goes on to say, but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So it's saying if the baby dies, if there's the death of the child, then it's murder. And again, last week we talked about there's a difference in the Bible between murder, self-defense, and killing and war. Those are all different categories. Murder is the shedding of innocent blood. And so the, the, the text is telling us here, it's totally different that the, the baby in the womb is a person, right? Has, has rights. But if you kill that baby, even unintentionally, there's, there's the, the law of murder and the, or the result of the law of murder in, in the Old Testament was death. It was punishable by death. Tooth for tooth and eye for eye, blood for blood. So again... It's also worth noting that this was an unintentional death. Like they weren't trying to do this, but yet God values human life that much. He said it's shedding of innocent blood. So nowhere in this text does it condone the killing of innocent life in the womb. I just don't understand where people get that. It makes no sense to me. I don't know if I'm reading the wrong verses that you're quoting, but there's a lot of people out there throwing this chapter out there. And you're like, you you missed the whole point. It actually provides arguments for the pro-life argument. Uh, Numbers 5, 11. We're not going to read the whole text because it's a long text. You can go back and read chapter 11, uh, uh, chapter 5, 11 through 31. But here's what's happening in this conversation. Um, and then how is this ritual that we're going to read about relevant to the modern abortion debate? Well, a lot of people read Numbers 5 and a lot of people out there are pushing and saying, see, this is, an, this is where God condones abortion. God himself not only condones it, but God caused the abortion. Um, and so Numbers 5.11 describes an unusual procedure known as the jealousy offering a husband could use to determine if his wife had been unfaithful to him. Essentially, the husband and wife would come to the priest. The priest would then create a con- concoction of unpleasant ingredients. Then the wife would have to drink the concoction. If the wife was guilty of adultery, she would get sick and her belly would swell. If the wife was innocent, God would protect her from the effects of the concoction. There was nothing magical about the concoction. It was entirely a matter of God using the result to demonstrate whether a woman was innocent or guilty. So in summary, this is telling us that your sins will find you out. That's another quote out of of Exodus. Your sins will find you out. So it's interesting that if you study... um, abortion historically it goes back thousands of years there is historical evidence where people were had these poisons or concoctions or things that would actually cause an abortion you know uh, uh for for many many i mean decades and millennia right it's just historically accurate this is not that whatsoever this is a totally different thing people would say see god it's just a book of fairy tales and god you know they're just putting god's name on something that was a thing of society this is something totally different God's saying this is a result of somebody, you know, living in sin and their sin finds them out. And so there's a fruit or a consequence that comes with that. Some propose um, that this is referring to abortion. So there's two translations of the Bible, which are very horrible translations. The 2011 version of the NIV, and then there's another one called the uh, NEB, New English Bible. Um, those are, if you study historical translations, 90, 90 plus percent of translators are going to say that word is not miscarriage there. But they use that term, and both of those Bibles translate a lot of the Bible based on today's um, kind of social justice and political mindsets. And so those are just not good translations. When you got somebody who comes out and says, hey, we found a new way to translate this, and it's totally different than scholars for thousands of years have said it is, you probably should look close. I mean, even non-Christian scholars say you're off. Like, that's, it's not way to interpret it. But that's how they interpret it. So um, it's not talking about miscarriage. It's not even talking about pregnancy in the sense of it's not even talking about a pregnant woman in the sense of um, that's not the whole point of the text, right? 
The only thing that even sounds like pregnancy is the guilty wife's stomach becoming bloated. But even in that instance, it doesn't have to do with pregnancy. Further, the passage does not say that drinking the concoction would cause an abortion or miscarriage. While drinking a poisonous mixture of ingredients could very well cause a miscarriage, that's not what it's talking about. So again, we've got to be so careful not to insert uh, what we want it to say. Uh, the pro-choice Bible, the NEB, uh, says that if God causes a miscarriage, it would therefore be an endorsement of people causing abortions. This is a huge stretch since neither the wife, husband, nor the priest made the decision to induce an abortion, nor would they have the right to have done so. The passage does not seem to refer to miscarriage at all, but even if it did, there is certainly nothing to suggest any endorsement of human beings initiating an abortion. So we're going to talk about this for a moment, because this is one that I've had a lot of questions about. How do I defend this? Well, again, it's not even talking about, you know, a baby in the womb. It's talking about, you know, later on you would not be able to have kids, maybe. But even if it's talking about that, it's not giving me a right today to now go abort a baby and doing it in the name of Numbers 5. See, God's pro-abortion. It doesn't say that whatsoever, and we're going to get into that. In this interpretation, there's no connection whatsoever to the modern debate over the sanctity of the unborn babies because this passage isn't even about a pregnant woman. Um, if the miscarriage view is accurate, so I'm not saying it is. I don't think it is whatsoever. Most scholars don't think it is, but let's say... Even if it was that this concoction caused a miscarriage, we need to look a bit closer. If the guilty woman was pregnant and the punishment for her infidelity and lies was that her child would die in miscarriage, would it imply that God took the life of, in the woman's womb? That would seem to be the case, but before dismissing this view for that reason, consider the following details from Scripture. So even if God took the, the life of the innocent child, Let's look bigger at the larger picture of who God is. He's perfect. We're not. He's a God of justice. You know, we're people that, you know, we get the wrath of his justice outside of Christ, right? So let's look at, let's say, okay, that God did take that innocent life. Let's see that, remember we talked about last week, the consequences of sin um, versus simply me choosing to take a life for an arbitrary reason. Remember we talked about what are some things in life that, that God gives us confines right he says do this and don't do this and if you don't there's consequence there's blessing if you do and there's consequence and one of them is this topic of sexuality which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit here but after david committed adultery with Bathsheba and at Bathsheba, she conceived the prophet nathan confronted david and said because by this deed you have utterly scorned the lord the child who is born to you shall die so a direct judgment on david's sin was the death of the child Following his sin of taking forbidden items from Jericho, Achan was stoned and then burned along with his son's daughters and the belongings. Sinned against God, there was immediate judgment. When Korah, Dathan, and Abraham rebelled against Moses, God ordained leadership. The Lord caused the earth to open up beneath Korah, Dathan, and Abraham, along with their wives, sons, and little ones. So what do these have to do with our discussion? Well, let's back up a minute. Is God a just God? We hear this a lot. I hear this a lot from people. That why would God not just eradicate evil? Why is there evil in the earth today if he's a good God? And so we think about it from our perspective. But let's say we mentioned this last week. Let's say that God tells us at midnight tonight he's going to remove all evil from the earth. Where does that leave me and you at 1201? See, we have it in our minds that we're good. And all those others are evil. And this takes us back to the foot of the cross conversation. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need redemption. We all need grace. And so at the end of the day, we are not the ones that get to put what's good and what's evil, what's just and what's unjust. When God has true judgment for sin, that's a holy God doing what a holy God does. We don't get to say what's right and what's wrong with that. You can dislike it. You can reject it. You can run away from it. You can flip him off. You can curse him. You can do whatever you want to do, but you're not God. I'm not God. It's way above our pay grade. So this is where the conversation, again, the Bible is not about me and you. It's about God. It's about his redemptive story, and he's good and for his glory, but how he redeemed us as sinful people. And so when we look at it that way, we look at these situations and we say, man, that's horrible that innocent life was taken. Those kids did nothing wrong. But their judgments from God versus me arbitrarily just saying, 
I don't want that thing. It's not a human life. I'm going to pull it out of the womb. You see the difference in that. There's a huge difference in that. Each of these situations, children died as a result of their father's sin. Let me say this real quick. In a couple weeks, we're kicking off our Did God Really Say series. Uh, We're getting a lot of discussion around this from people. We're going to talk about all kinds of topics that are very difficult in the Bible. This is just kind of a prelude. But one of the weeks we're going to talk about, you know, you know, why God, it seems to, to shed innocent blood. Like he just, he wiped out groups of people and that's an unjust God. Well, but we've got to look at the bigger picture about who was being wiped out and what was going on and what's the bigger conversation. But here we see that children died as, as a direct result of the parent's sin. For the wages of sin is death. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, sin, this is what the church many times in America, we, we have such a low standard of sin. Sin against the holy God is deserving of punishment. And again, we, well, if you don't look at it from a holy God and an unholy people, you think it's unjust, but you're putting your standard of justice. You're saying a holy God actually is inviting an unholy people to be sons and daughters and to be redeemed by his own blood. That is an amazing story. That's the gospel. But if you don't understand that, then you look at it from a human perspective and your own standard of justice. Well, where is that anchored into, which we'll talk about a little bit later? Where is your worldview anchored into? In David's case, the child died one week after being born, and the other two examples may have included pregnant women in addition to those children already born. The point is that there are examples in the Old Testament where the sins of the father or mother led directly to the death of their children. With that in mind, reconsider the miscarriage view of Numbers 5. If the woman was pregnant through an adulterous relationship, a sin that normally carried the death penalty, but because there was no witnesses that came forward, the woman was given an opportunity to clear her name and ease her husband's suspicions by swearing before him and a priest and God uh, that she was innocent of adultery. If she lied in this situation, the subsequent miscarriage is clearly a result of blatant rebellion of swearing falsely before the Lord in addition to her adultery, knowing the consequences. And so it is, again, it's a, it's a fruit of consequence. And that's one thing that I think is interesting about the Old Testament. And then even early in the New Testament, we see God judging people quickly for sin. Ananias and Sapphira, and we see the one that, you know, um, you know that was handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. We see different places where God brought swift judgment, and we just look at that as Christians. And because we're under grace and God's judgment is a little more long longevity, right? He doesn't just zap us with lightning bolts every time we sin. I think we take grace for granted many times. But it's still the same God, just a different covenant. And when we look at it that way, it should make us so grateful for grace and the new covenant. It should make us, oh my gosh, so many things that I do throughout my day, I'm guilty. I uh, was driving home from the gym Saturday morning, and I was booking along there on Highway 12, and it's kind of open in there, and it was early morning, and somebody just, I mean, blew by me. And I made the statement, came out of my mouth, I said, wow, that person's breaking the law. I wish there was a cop around. And then I glanced down, and I was going eight miles over the speed limit. They were going a lot more over the speed limit than I was. But I was more holy than them, right? (laughs) Oh, let me say it this way. I was less guilty than them. No. I was going eight miles over the speed limit. I was breaking the law, but I was like, man, somebody needs to hold that. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, but for the grace of God, go I, Galatians 6, consider yourself when you sin or when you're, you you know, when your brother falls into sin, that that you who are spiritual restore such one, considering yourself. We're so quick to point the judge and realize, oh my goodness, we got to look at our lives and we got to look at how, where are the sins in my life and where is God putting his finger and where is God withholding judgment from my life? That doesn't mean we don't speak truth in love, but we're called to to, to look inward and to humble ourselves in our own lives. And that plays into this conversation as well. I just wish, I, I feel like, uh, many of you have told me over the years, I, I feel like I'm hard and I'm a butthead sometimes, but many of you just said, you, you're gracious, Nate. You're, you're so hard on yourself. But I just wish people could, could see this, the one-on-ones and the sitting across the tables and the weeping of, of just serving our body when people are just struggling with sin or going through things or, you know, loss of life. And you know, I'm not a hard nose. Like I preach the truth because it's the truth and I preach it black and white because it's black and white. 
And that's part of my role. But don't see me as just that. See me as a compassionate human who's wrestling with my own story. I'm wrestling with my own sins and trying to figure those things out. But the truth is God's truth. I will never water that down. And so I'm not, I'm not, God, the amount of tears I've cried over this topic, the amount of people we've sat across, women and, and boyfriends and husbands and the abortion conversation, it is so complicated. The amount of doctors I've talked with that, that wrestle with, and they're like, I, everything you say is 100% accurate. But there's, the, there's a wrestling with when you do have to go into an operating room and try to save the baby and the mother, and the baby still dies. It's not abortion, but it is a loss of life. That's why it's called the sanctity of human life. Anytime human life is lost, we should grieve. Because that's God's heart, and that's the bigger picture of all this. So please don't hear me. I, I just sense like there's almost this, oh, this guy's just a jerk. I wonder what he's, he probably abuses his kids. I, I just, I, it's just... Sometimes I just hear that, like people see me that way. And I have sat in more hospital rooms and more counseling sessions and more living rooms, give up my own personal time, not just because it's my, my, my pastoral calling, but because it's the weekend and it's, we were, had something planned, but we went to where people had need because that's the gospel. That's what we do. And so this right here, this picture, is that we shouldn't wink at sin. We shouldn't just dismiss it because there is consequence with it. The priest did not surgically abort the woman's child. Instead, in a case where witnesses could not be found to determine the guilt or innocence, God revealed the woman's guilt by causing her to miscarry. Again, if the miscarriage is, is it's, not even, it's not even there, but we're saying it is. God causing her miscarriage and preventing her from ever conceiving again, which would be a severe consequence in that culture. He's a just God, and he moves swiftly if that's the case. Even if miscarriage view is correct, it cannot be used as justification for abortion because abortion was not performed. Um, it was a judgment for sin. Um, rather than supporting abortion, this passage shows us that God treats the unborn child the same as those who have already been born. That is, in certain situations, a child died because of his or, parents, his or her parents' grave sin. Um, some people have, have talked about why is that such a weird ritual. I mean, if you take someone out of that time frame and bring them into, uh, again, if I, off I offended some people for a service, but I'm still going to say it because it's just, it's weird to me. I moved here 15 years ago and I got invited to a, a football game and I love football and I sat in this stadium with tens of thousands of people and I thought this is the most cultish thing I've ever seen. And I grew up in a cult, right? People are like wearing leather heads with pigs on them and woo, pigs. I mean, it was just chance and, and I'm going, and the church gets flack for some of the weird things in the Bible. So take someone from their day, put them in Razorback Stadium next week or whenever the football game is. They're going to look around and go, oh, my goodness. So I'm not knocking the Razorbacks. I'm not saying it's unbiblical. I'm not saying stop doing it. All I'm saying is it's a weird ritual, okay? <laughs> Can I just say that, right? From people on the outside. I'm from the north, and it was just really weird. But this is a ritual, but it was a God-given ritual, right? And so we have to look at it. People have asked me that. I'm like, just think about the weird things we do. So um, what this passage of Scripture actually does is it points us back to some things we addressed last week, that God sets boundaries uh, for our benefit and the consequence uh, when we go outside of those boundaries. Um, there is a sure way to avoid 96 to 98 percent of risk of becoming or impregnating a woman. It's called abstinence. We hit on that last week. And we're going to see some stats today that talk about incest and rape and, and different ones like that, abuse. And those are conversations that, that are not just stats. Those are people that have had horrendous, absolutely horrible situations. But it just blows my mind when we talk about abstinence. You know, any, any sexual porn, pornography, heterosex, homosexual, any sexual engagement outside of the confines of one man, one woman in, in marriage, the way God created it, it's porneia. It's sinful. And there's like this sexual atheism in today's Christian world today. I meet people and they're just like, yeah, I'm living with my girlfriend. We love each other. We're getting married and God's blessing it, you know. No, God's not blessing it. That's called sin. Like you just can't endorse. God's not going to endorse something he's called sinful. And so we want to say, well, that sin's worse than that sin. Your sin is equally sinful. And so, again, I'm on sin today because that, that's really, even in the confines of me and Monica and our marriage, one man, one woman, we're a virgin, we were married. Hey, guess what? It still works the same. You put the sperm and the egg together and there's a baby. And so even in the confines of marriage, we had to say, we're going to be responsible. So if we're going to consummate that act, if we're going to do that, we have to understand that we might get pregnant. And what do we do with that? For us, it's a blessing from God. But what about when we say we're done with children? 
you see, it's, it's, it's not a simple conversation. It's complicated, but it's black and white in Scripture. You either say no or you live with whatever comes from that, right? And kids are never consequences. We talked about that last week. But remember, we talked about last week some areas where Monica had given a devotion to our family last week. Where is fire good, right? And where is fire not good? And fire and the kids said, well, when dad burned down the backyard, that wasn't good, right? You know, in the back fence, it just wasn't good. And, and there's other places, fire's good in a fire pit and fire's good in a fireplace. And, and so we talked about the book of Proverbs says when a man pursues a uh, prostitute, it's as if he brings fire into his bosom. And we talked about last time we checked, fire in a man's bosom is not a good thing, right? And so fire is good in the confines of where it's supposed to be. God created things and he put them in boundaries. When we get outside of the covenant boundaries of what God says, there are results or consequences. And so if we could just abide, I'm going to say this facetious, if we could just all just abide by God's law, right? Yeah, let's just do what the Bible, if all of us were just perfect, well, that's not the world we live in. But we're also not going to, to lower the standard of God's word. So I hope everybody's still okay. Some stats uh, from the Guttenmacher Institute, uh, which is a pro-choice group, cdc.government. 40% of minors having abortions do not report it to their parents. So they're having abortions. They can't go uh, drink alcohol legally. They can't get a gun legally, um, but they can go get an abortion legally. Like there's, there's something wrong with that. Uh, an estimated 930,000 uh, abortions took place in America in 2020. In 2019, approximately 19% of U.S. pregnancies ended in abortion. More than 60 million legal abortions have occurred in the United States since 1973. Uh, national stats say that on average, uh, 1% are victims of rape, and 0.5% are victims of incest. And that's the one that everybody wants to always argue. What about rape and incest? We're going to talk about that in a minute, and it's, it's, it's an important one. But let's talk about the 98%, right? Let's talk about the, the, the bigger conversation, and we'll get to that. The state of Florida records a reason for every abortion that occurs within its borders. In 2020, there were 74,868 abortions in Florida. 0.01% were results of incest. 0.015 results of rape. 0.20, the woman's life was endangered by the pregnancy. 0.98%, there was a serious fetal abnormality. 1.48, the woman's physical health was endangered. 1.88, the woman's psychological health was endangered. 20.4, social or economic reasons. 74.9, no reason but simply elective. I put this in here because, again, you hear all the time. You hear it as all the talking points. A woman should have a right because of incest and rape and health and all of these things. Well, when you really dig down and you start talking, we talked about this last week, if the mother's health is in danger, we got somebody sitting here today, mother's health is in danger, life flighted her to Little Rock, they didn't abort her child. They performed health care on the mother and performed health care on the child. You see the difference in that. And so if the mother's life's in danger, absolutely we're going to do everything. We, the doctors are going to do everything they can to take care of that, but there's another human being in the conversation that should have human rights and that we should give 100% health care to. So those, even when you look at some of these statistics, it, it, it doesn't really play the narrative that a lot of people want us to understand. Uh, also, the fact that there's a high percentage of people that it's just, you can go do the research yourself. These were actually very generous to the pro-choice argument because I'm that way. I'm going to lean more towards, so I'm not stacking these odds. There are others, the other ones that say even less or more in areas that would actually push the pro-life agenda. But I, I prefer the ones that are pushing the pro-choice because those are the stats that are out there, and I want to use those stats. Do your own research and then start whittling down and say, oh, my goodness, this is, it's not as complicated as, as it's making it sound in the media. So biblical worldview compared to others. Um, I would say this, I've said it for years, and I said it last week, and I've not seen any changes, so I'm going to keep saying it until I see changes. The average Christian in America does not live a Christian or a biblical worldview. Every other influence in, in the world, they don't live a biblical worldview. But let's say, what is your worldview? This matters. We did this in detail in our, um, oh, I forgot the series. I think it was uh, Understanding the Times, where we broke these down in greater detail. But let's say you're a Darwinist, right? Darwinian evolution, that's your worldview. Uh, natural selection or survival of the fittest. If that's your worldview that you're anchored into, then you really don't have any arguments because if a man wants to go pass on his seed and rape every woman and pillage and kill and do what he wants, that worldview says if you follow it to its logical conclusion, he's doing everything that he's supposed to do. That's a horrible worldview. 
So don't talk to the Christian worldview about morality when that's your worldview. You got naturalism or materialism, which means every action or inclination or thought is based only on natural desires or instincts. So basically, if it feels good, do it. So follow that worldview to its fullest conclusion. If it feels good, well, what if it feels good for me to murder? What if it feels good for me to take your new car or to bash in your windows or whatever that looks like? Again, not a good argument. Secular humanism, truth is relevant to my situation. So if truth is relevant to my situation and my wants, you know, there is no moral absolutes, then, then where can you say that what I'm doing is wrong and what you're doing is right? It's moral relativism. My, my, my morality is relevant to my situation. And so we, we can't argue that. That's a horrible worldview to even say, the, you, where do you have any moral stance to say abortion's right and, and pro-life's wrong? Because you, well, that's my truth, right? That, that's the argument. Marxism, it creates classes of people and puts values where they determine many views. Uh, many times viewing the marginalized is not necessary and less than leading to the devaluing human life and historically this world worldview has slaughtered millions. A lot of young people are like, man, that Marxist worldview, it looks pretty cool and I'm going to pursue that and it's just never been tried in a good, right environment. Like, just follow history. It literally classes people and devalues the weakest among and says this color and this race and this one's lower and less than, this social economic status is less than. There is no justice in any of that. The pantheistic worldview, which is huge in the world today, it puts greater value on animals and the environment over human life. I know people that are pro-choice, and they will just rant and rave about pro-life people, and it's my right, my body. But man, if they see somebody who left a, a puppy on the side of the road, they just think they're the most inhumane person in the world, and they should be, I've literally heard them say, that person should be put to death. Well, if I use your arguments, it was best for their situation. Maybe they couldn't afford it. Maybe Would, you have better, would it have been better to wring its neck? Because that's what abortion does, right? Where, where's your moral compass on that? If that's your moral view, then it's just nature and, and, and all of that is all better than the human life, which is contrary to God, we talked about last week. Those are horrible worldviews. Christian worldview is the only viable worldview that produces justice, compassion, love, and human equality. So as a Christian... I would challenge you and beg you and plead with you as a pastor here, if you will just lean into your biblical worldview and say, I'm going to have a worldview that is biblical. You've got, uh, when people start talking about social injustice and all of these, you know, movements that are horizontal, you can look and say, yeah, the Bible answers those questions. Yeah, God has a response for that. Don't cower away and say, well, I just don't really have a voice because I'm a Christian and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm one of those that I can't really talk. No, you've got the best worldview. Know your Bible. Know what the, the Scripture says. Know what the biblical community at Catalyst is doing. How can we live that out? And, and just live it out to your dissenters. Don't necessarily have to argue at all. A balanced world, biblical worldview, you will develop ways to share the love of Christ through Scripture, science, philosophy, in a loving, compassionate, Christ-honoring way. You can share your faith and, and tell why it's compelling to be pro-life. One of the things, uh, my daughter Emma, she's she's... Uh, been on this bandwagon for many years and she's just she volunteers at local organizations and she's just a fighter about this topic and we've talked for years about how many people that are pro-choice and when she talks about hey I'm pro-life and you know and, and they just I mean they call her some of the nastiest names to her face and they have just threatened her I mean the things that have happened to her and she's like but I thought I had a choice like where's my choice you literally said it's pro-choice but oh when my choice isn't what you want it to be then the violence comes out See, that shows you that it's not truly pro-choice, it's agenda-driven, which is sinful. It's the way of the world. We do that in our own lives, probably, you know, but we've got to say the standard is what is the biblical worldview. So um, many who are pro-choice advocate for government financing. They have no financial skin in the game, while at the same time they attack pro-life groups who are sacrificing time, treasure, talent to live in, live out their beliefs. So um, I'm going to read about pregnancy resource centers, uh, PRCs. Uh, they do incredible work to support mothers, fathers, and babies before, during, and after birth. Nationwide, there are about 2,700 PRCs. So, put that in comparison to how many abortion clinics. It is through the roof, the difference. I've heard as many as 10 to 1, but even as we're going to see in a minute, 3 to 1 is a common stat that, that you know, pro-choicers will say. So these are organizations. Let me read about these organizations. They serve almost 2 million people a year. They provide nearly $270 million in services at virtually no 
charge. I watched a video this week. This guy went on a college campus and was talking about, hey, should health care be free to all these college students? And every last one of them but one said, absolutely. Yes, it's a human right. Everybody should be, I should have, you know, all the contraceptives and I should have anything. And he said, well, who's going to pay for it? And every last one of them said, I don't know. It's wonderful that every, yeah, sure, everything should be free. But who's going to pay for it? Again, that's this ideology and it's putting it off on someone else. No personal responsibility, which is a, it's a, it's a cuss word to tell young people and anybody that you're personally responsible for your actions. And it's like this cuss word, this, oh my gosh, it's like the wicked witch that got water poured on her. And, ah, I can't handle it, I can't handle it. It's personal responsibility. It's not just biblical, it's just, just, just look around you. This world's not about you and there's other people, you know, and, and it, you stop being so selfish. But the fact of the matter is these pregnancy resource centers are doing this work mostly by Christian volunteers and money and finances. And it, yet it's poo-pooed. On the media just makes fun of and mocks. And as we're going to see in a minute, they're calling for the closing of these things. PRCs operate largely through the generosity and commitment of volunteers and donors. Many medical care, many provide medical care, parenting classes, assistance with financial programs, assistance to victims of human trafficking, housing counseling, and much more. I said this last week. Um, if you want to argue with me about, well, you Christians, you say you're pro-life, but it's, you, you're just you know, pro-life in the womb, and after that, I'll show you my checkbook. I'll show you the catalyst balance, the, the ledger that we, all the money that we give as a church, as a missions organization, how much the Sweeney's give, how much time we give, how much time our church people give in volunteering to these organizations, and you tell me, and we're talking foster and adopted, we're talking girls that are taken out of sex trafficking, we're talking about women that have been completely abused and neglected, and they're brought into these groups free of charge that we get to be a part of. So stop the talking points. We are doing this work. We're just not out there trumpeting and, and virtue signaling all about it. We are doing, this is what the gospel is. Now, many churches aren't, and they're burying their heads in the sand, and they have a lot of talking points too. But we are doing these things. And a lot of organizations, we put in your bulletin, not bulletin, but online notes in all the areas, say there's 10 local organizations that we support and that we're a part of that you can serve, time, treasure, talent. We encourage you, take that list. Do something with that list. Former presidential candidate and current senator said this week, Elizabeth Warren, she said this this last week, in Massachusetts right now, these crisis pregnancy centers that are there to fool people who are looking for pregnancy termination uh, help outnumber true abortion clinics three to one. She, she, that's the common stat. We need to shut them down here in Massachusetts, and we need to shut them down all around the country. You should not be able to torture a pregnant person like that. This is a former presidential candidate. We got an argument going on right now in our country about a former president who made some pretty silly comments, and people say it incited a riot, and we want to have all this justice, which is fine. Let's pursue it. But is that not, is that not inciting? We've got to get rid of these? There are all these... A lot of these pregnancy centers are reporting vandalisms and death threats, and they're burning the buildings down. Like, it's just not... Not happening. It's happening right now in our country. And we got leaders like this standing up saying they're a menace to society. Why are they? Look at the work they're doing. So it shows me there's a spiritual underbelly to the pro-choice agenda. There's, a, there's an underbelly of something. Why would you care if they're offering all of these services? It's helping people. So I'm going to jump ahead, and, and, and I told you last week these, these two weeks were going to be a little, a little longer. So I'm going to take the time here. Uh, five differences. Well, there's some common ob objections in my notes. You can read through all those. Uh, we're not going to get into all of those. But five differences between Nate now and Nate in the womb. I learned this when I was in high school in an Understanding the Times class. It's called, it's an acronym, SLED. Everybody remember, S-L-E-D. And then I'm going to add a W at the end. I learned the SLED when I was in high school. So... Number one is size. People argue about size, right? Size in the womb, right? How far along are they? Whatever. Shaquille O'Neal is not more valuable than any of us simply because he's seven feet tall. And vertically challenged people are not less valued simply because they are not of the same size. That's a, uh, Years ago, one of my short friends in, in my life, she referred to herself as vertically challenged. I think that's, I think it's cute. I think it's funny, right? So size. So Nate... In the womb versus Nate now. I'm not more valuable now because of my size. Whereas I was unvaluable back then because my size was smaller. Number two, level of development. 
four-year-old is less developed than a 20-year-old, are they less valuable because they have a different level of physical or mental development? So it's okay to kill Nate in the womb because he was less developed, but it's not okay to kill him now. Why? Where, where, is, where is that grounded? Where is, is the, the facts and all of that? I mean, there are people saying today that, okay, they are human, but they're not personhoods, and it, it de depends on the level of development. A lot of stats are coming out. It's up to one years old, two years old, three-year-old. So at what point can we kill them? Up to three years old? Because their level of development, their cognitive awareness is not fully there yet? Or at the end of their life when they're struggling with Alzheimer's, we should just get rid of all the Alzheimer's patients and kill all the people in the nursing homes because their, their life is not as uh, vibrant as it once used to be? You see, these arguments are so arbitrary. We got we to gotta invest them into Bible and we got to invest them into science and biology. Uh, number three is environment. How does where you are change what you are? If a journey from the living room into the kitchen does not change your value, how then does a seven-inch journey down a birth canal from something we could potentially kill or a human being or not? So Nate in the living room, Nate in the kitchen. Doesn't it just seem silly? Nate in the living room, man, you can kill him. Nate in the kitchen, seven inches, birth canal. What, what, why? What, what, where did we come up with this? It's not anchored into science. It's not anchored into embryology. It's not in the Bible. Number four is degree of dependency. Sure, you depended on your mother for survival. However, why should I believe that dependence on another human being says that I can kill you? Conjoined twins depend on each other for survival. We don't kill them because they're dependent upon one another. These arguments just begin to crumble. The last one, the W, is want. If they're wanted or not. Whether someone is wanted or not does not qualify the person to be worthy of life or not. Again, we've talked about the people in our body that were products of rape. Their parents or their mother chose to keep them. When I talk about the rape and the incest, those are not just statistics and numbers. Those are people that have been abused in horrible situations. But we're not going to take a horrible situation and then complicate it by adding murder to it. That, that, that doesn't solve the problem. And so, again, they're very complicated conversations, but it's still we can't minimize or water down the truth. Talking to a doctor friend recently, and he said, look, I've seen optopic pregnancies, and I've seen them where, you know, the women's, I mean, she's bleeding out, and we've had to go in and do a procedure that ended up ending the life of the child. Oh, my gosh, I, I'm up awake at night sometimes, he said. But it wasn't an abortion. It wasn't a arbitrary decision. It was trying to do the best to save both. That's true health care. And so you don't have to like it. But at least if you're going to argue, argue with facts, argue with science, argue with biology. These five differences are morally insignificant. They have no bearing on whether we can kill you, whether or not we can kill you. These are the same arguments Lincoln made with slavery. And in, in a famous uh, speech he gave in October of 1854 in Peoria, Illinois, you say A is white and B is black. It is color than the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be the slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. You do not mean color exactly. You mean the whites are intellectually the superiors of the blacks. Therefore, have the right to enslave them. Take care again. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But you say it is a question of interest, and if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another very well. And if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. If you studied that whole history and what was going on during that time and the amount of people that used those three arguments, the, the last one, just crazy. Well, it's going to crash the economy, and if we, we, if we just let all the slaves go. and So you're saying that's... Good enough excuse to keep somebody and stuff. You know it's wrong. So it's a money thing. It's a profiting thing. So the person, the next person that comes along that wants to do that to you, if they're stronger than you, if they're smarter than you, if they have a lighter skin than you, you see how arbitrary that is? You see how, I mean, just demonic that is. That's not valuing all race, colors, creeds, backgrounds, socioeconomic, because we're all made in the image of God. That's, that's watering down the conversation. Jesus said in Revelation, 
around the throne, there will be every race, creed, color, every background, every, every group that has ever existed. There will be a representation of that. That's the gospel. So who are we to arbitrarily put these different ideas or how we feel about something on such an important topic? All right, I'm going to uh, wind it down here if the worship team would come. Uh, I'm going to read a few statements here. Seven second defense of pro-life. Again, this is from Scott Klusendorf. If you've not, if you're really passionate about this topic, I'd encourage you to look after some of his stuff. I'm pro-life because it's wrong to kill innocent human beings. If somebody asks, that could open the door to a deeper conversation. It's a one minute argument. It's wrong to kill innocent human beings. And the science of embryology has clearly shown that from the one cell stages of development, that people are distinct living and whole human beings. You are not a part of another human being like the skin cells on the back of my hand. You were already a whole living member of the human family, even though you had yet to grow and mature. There is no essential difference between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, that would justify killing you back then. Differences of size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency are not good reasons to say you, have, you could have been killed then, but not now. So again, a lot of people, I've read a lot of his stuff, they take this, they memorize it, they put it in there. Like I keep a Google Doc and I just keep this stuff in it with me so if people ask, you know, I get to check out Walmart. They're like, hey, Pastor Nate, I got a theological question. And it's never the simple questions, right? Well, how about we set up an appointment? Like that's a, but if you need to, think about that. That's a quick argument to, to defend. So I want us to end. I've got a couple of takeaways. But I want to sincerely ask this body, if you're, if you're a new believer, non-believer, uh, maybe you're not a part of Catalyst. We invite you to do wherever the Lord's leading you. We want to invite you into that. But if you're a believer, you're Catalyst, you're here, I, I want to encourage this conversation. The same fervor and passion that is shown for the unborn must be pursued as the dignity of all people once they are born. The overturning of Roe v. Wade in America has only allowed there to be a level playing field on this fight. The battle has just begun. The amount of Christians that I've seen on social media spiking the football, and we won, we didn't win nothing. All we've done is things are moving in one direction, and we've turned around, and we're starting into the other direction. We have a long way to go. And I challenge you to look at your time, your treasure, your talent. We at Catalyst, if you're, you've been here, we ask you to give time, treasure, talent to Catalyst. That's what God asks the local church. What are you doing with that? But I would take it a step farther. What are you doing with this topic that is so near and dear to the heart of God? There's so many volunteer opportunities. There's financial needs. On that list that we have, we have it on, our, on uh, in the office as well. There are long lists that each one of these organizations, sometimes they just need toilet paper every month. You can say, I'll bring by a case of toilet paper once a month. Everybody can be involved. They're looking for prayer people. Loving Choices gives out their Friday prayer. I mean, we had... I sat in the car and wept the other day. As I read that email, and there was all kinds of EGS, experience growth shares, where lives are being transformed. But a lady, they quoted her, and, and she, you know they can't give any details, but they said, we came in as a statistic. My daughter was raped, and we just found out she's pregnant. Underage. And they came in and we're going to choose life because that's what God wants of us. And every time we, now I'm putting my two cents in this. That was the end of that. But I, I added a little bit to that. Her exact quote was, we're choosing life, right? But we've had others in the past. Let God redeem that. Let God redeem that situation. Instead of looking at that child and say it's a curse or it's a consequence, you can say, every time I look at that, there's God's grace involved in that. But that doesn't come naturally. It comes supernaturally. Me and Emma were talking earlier about some stats, the amount of stats that are coming out, post-abortion stats. These are government stats, the amount, 150 times more suicidal a year after an abortion. All the, I mean, tens of thousands of women's pulled, the amount of trauma. It's not just I pulled some you know, dead skin cells off my skin. I mean, there, there's so much more. It's spiritual, it's emotional, it's physical. And so at Catalyst, we're not telling you to get over it. We're not telling you. We're, all we're saying is inviting you into deeper conversation. Maybe you're one that's had an abortion. You can sit across the table from a young lady who's contemplating it.
Maybe you were a product of rape. Maybe fill in the blank. You've got a story. Maybe you were abused. Maybe you were taken out of sex trafficking. We have people in our church with those backgrounds. You can sit across the table and you can minister life to these individuals in an area that you found grace and redemption. Now, if you haven't found grace and redemption, then that's, that's your next step. I hope that makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave these. Um, there's three takeaways. Maybe you can just scroll those Kindle in the next few moments. But I want to leave a few moments for prayer, and then we're going to worship on the way out. Would you guys stand with me? I know it's been long. This is a little longer than normal the last two weeks. But, but these are important conversations. If you need to meet, if you want to talk, if you want counsel or biblical wisdom, reach out. But I want to take some time to pray. If you need prayer, I would ask our prayer people to go to the back that, that have been elders and deacons and different ones. Just be at the back. Lord, we just, we don't want to run out of here with such a heavy topic. Our goal is not just to get a bunch of amens and say we talked about this. Our goal is to wash the feet of people that have been affected by this tra tragedy or tragedies. And so, God, we ask for healing in our body. We ask for truth to be at the forefront, break through the lies of the enemy. So Holy Spirit, we just, we just give you time to work. Do what you do. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I know, I just, I just know there are people that have been, I know because of experience, but I know there are those even listening to this message that have experienced fruits or consequences of this topic. And Lord, you're inviting us into healing, forgiveness, deliverance. Hmm. I just sense there's, there's somebody in here, it's a young lady, that um, there are some things going on in your life and it's been pretty consistent and you just can't put your finger on how, how why is this happening and it's not good things. And, and, and I believe it, it stems from a spiritual root, some things uh, that God wants to free you from. And so I believe that that's something that you need to approach a prayer person about. I think the Lord can do it right here, right now. If it's a longer conversation and you need to get with a counselor or uh, a trusted individual like that, you know, we've got resources that we can direct you to. But part of your struggle has been um, the shame, the, the, the darkness that surrounds this thing in your life. <laughs> And I believe you know that, and I believe that right now, even as I'm talking, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The enemy hates that you're here. The enemy hates that I'm saying what I'm saying, and there's just an open door. You may say, Nate, why do you take time and do prayer like this? And it seems pretty open and could be kind of for anybody. And the amount of people that God ministers through in times like this, it, it, it's more than just a message. It's the Holy Spirit. I had three scenarios this week where people... One from years ago and two from months ago where this we just took a moment and God just did some powerful transformation in their life in those moments. But we're not going to rush through. You got to go, that's fine. But Lord, we pray that you expose that thing right now to them and you shed light on it. And, and you're going to use their story for your glory on the other side of this thing. You're going to bring healing and deliverance and freedom. And those things that were struggles, they're just going to begin to... Like, um, uh, I see almost like burnt um, ash. It's just going to blow away. The Lord's going to just do it right before your eyes. But it involves you taking that step, acknowledging and getting prayer. Thank you, Father God. And Lord, I pray um, that Catalyst is a light and darkness. And it is a safe place to fall and to heal and be restored and um I pray that you're opening our eyes as a body. I believe there are many people here that have the hearts to do some of the things we've talked about, but Lord, we need to put some shoe leather to some of these conversations. Lord, I pray in this next season that you invite us, you convict us, that you almost 
give us sleepless nights until we commit our time, our treasure, our talent to the bigger kingdom conversations. And that, Lord, people will look a year from now and five years from now and say, that place on the hill up at the top there called Catalyst Church, it is like a beacon in this, in this region. And God is doing some cool things. And wow, God's hands upon that place. Lord, let that be uh, what we're known for, that we're known for you and for making you known, not about one person's name or any of us individually, but God, it's all about you. And Jesus, it's all about you. Bringing freedom to the captives, discovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed. Lord, that we proclaim as Jesus did the, the acceptable year of the Lord. Lord, that people will come and they will see hope and they will see truth. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah.